Hello everyone, I'm Teacher Crocodile. Hello everyone, I'm Teacher Stars. Today we're going to look at a second course, Programming. The programming course involves two sets. First is 1269 and the other is 1206. Let's look at 1269. 1269 has been around for a while, but there are still many people who don't know all the things they can do with it. Today, we'll get deeper into 1269 and do some simple practice. First, let's think about it what the most important part of 1269 is. It's the micro bit controller. Teacher thought, have you ever used a micro bit device? Yes, I have. Okay, good. You have a little bit of experience then. Do you know what revisions Microbit has made this year? There are regular revisions this year. When we introduce Microbit, we also look at the newest and other recent versions. Let's give a quick overview. Starting with the basic Microbit, let's look at the basic functionality. Microbit is made by the BBC in the UK. They design a small, cheap, and easy to use chip that can be given safely to children so they can take their programming hobby with them wherever they go. It's about the size of a business card, so it fits easily in any pocket. As long as there is a computer with internet access, we can learn and practice programming. We can see in this picture that it's being used worldwide. In addition to countries, Microbit also cooperates with businesses such as Samsung, Microsoft and Bluetooth device manufacturers. We still have established a convenient way of usage. For example, we all know that when you see the Bluetooth icon, the device will have the necessary Bluetooth connectivity to do things like remote control devices. For example, if you see the Microsoft logo, you know you will be able to run certain programs on certain devices. One other major software you'll need to know about is the coding language called Python. Python is a coding language that has many graphical interfaces developed for it. This makes it easy to learn and if you want to, you can use Python directly and skip the graphical part. So, why is Microbit good for learning programming? Well, it cooperates with many companies, and it's frequently updated. Here we know the version of this particular microbit board has been updated from 1.5 to 2.0. The latest update has brought some improved functions, but before we get to that, let's look at the basic functions. It has 25 LEDs arranged in a 5x5 grid. If you have seen the microbit board before, you know there are 25 dots on the front. In addition to the 25 LEDs, there are two buttons, A and B. Let's look at a picture of the microbit. There are other pins that can connect other devices. In addition to the A and B buttons, this means the board can be extended in many ways. For example, it can measure light and temperature. By shaking it, you can trigger actions using the accelerometer. Or you can even measure magnetic fields. We use the microbit to do a lot of interesting projects. The most important thing is that it can be connected via Bluetooth. We could also use the radio system to communicate with other microbits and devices or connect it directly with a USB cable. Now, let's take a look at the appearance of the microbit board. We can see two boards here. Thanks, teacher thought. Can you spot any differences between these two boards? The color? That's not what I mean. It's not that simple. We can see the pictures here. Have a closer look. The one on the left is version 1.5. The version we used before. The other is 2.0. Did you spot a small dot down in the bottom right hand corner of the 2.0 version? This little dot is a microphone. But it's a microphone and a touchpad. When we press it like this, it detects the pressure. You can touch it with your finger. This is a new feature in version 2.0. Flip it over to the reverse side. There are changes here too. This is the 1.5 version and here's the 2.0 version. Do you see the extra box in the middle? This box is a small speaker. 
it can play sounds. The Bluetooth antenna is stronger in the 2.0 version. If you use a mobile phone to connect to it, the signal would be better. Generally speaking, version 2.0 is more stable and powerful. It is a bit larger. Mostly because of the speaker, so it looks a little thicker. But that's okay, it's still very well designed. The board has two versions, 1.5 and 2.0. You should make sure you choose the correct version of the Google Control Box, so that would be either version 1.5 or 2.0. If we take a look at the detail specifications, the two are mostly the same. But a 2.0 version has some CPU and RAM upgrades and makes it a bit faster to use. Then there's the new microphone, the small dot we just saw on the front. That small microphone can both play and record sounds. It has a built-in speaker and touch-sensitive logo on the front. Other functions like the original pen configuration and the voltage pins remain the same. And the whole new version only adds functions. Take a look here. The original compass and accelerometer were put together in this small box. But in the 2.0 version, they are separate. Why? Well, in version 1.5, there was a problem if you touch it with a highly magnetized object. It will reduce accuracy readings or damage components, so they were separate this time to reduce the risk of damage. Now it is more durable. Also, the Bluetooth is version 5.0, so you can see the larger antenna. Of course, Bluetooth antenna provides a stronger signal for better connection. Finally, we can see that the external current values have changed. The old one was about 90 MA. That was the maximum. Now it's 200 MA. Why such a big jump? Well, they found that people were wanting to add more and more devices. And Daisy changed things, so they had to increase it. If the required current is not available, this can damage some devices or the micro bit, or maybe just not work correctly. When switched on, this was a big jump in current. The device data sheet is available here and online. The official website has all the latest information. Here's the table as a reference for you. Next. Let's go deeper to see what happens when microbit is combined with Giggle's main control box. To clarify, the Giggle control box has two versions that pair with the two microbit versions, 1.5 and 2.0. We can first think about the advantages of combining the Giggle control box and the board. In fact, there are three advantages shown on the slide. The first is safe and foolproof. Because the main function of combining Giga control box with the microbit board is to prevent children from touching the board directly. Make sure children not touch microbit board. Why is that? The children's hands may be dirty, wet, or greasy, and these things can build up over time on the board and cause issues. Maybe rusting or short circuits. So, after the board is in the Giga control box, Children can use it that way, so the micro bed doesn't get damaged. This can greatly increase the lifespan of the micro bed board. The part of foolproof is that there are many connectors on the board, and if you never used the micro bed before, it can be a bit confusing. Would you be afraid to connect the pins manually? I would. If I did it wrong, I may damage the chip. Yes, so this way it can't happen. So we found a way to prevent this. Thus, in the Giggle control box, all the pins are pre-wired correctly. Children can use the wrong holes or connectors and just need to follow the instruction manual. 
The control box has preset positions clearly marked. This helps children install everything correctly. It's also easier to extend the functionality. As we mentioned earlier, some people like to add a lot of devices, like an angle servo motor or motors with LED lights. After children add it to their device, they will have to wire it and connect the wires directly to the board. It's a bit bothersome. So, we designed this as we want children to get the most out of their micro bed. This way, it becomes more like a plug and play device. Just connect the pins and start using it immediately. Of course, we still need to write the programs, but the control box still makes it easier. For expanding it, it becomes much easier. This is the second advantage. The last advantage is the wide range of components you can add. What are the components mentioned here? There are parts of building blocks, because we use these to assemble the devices. Then there's the motors and the LED lighting. These really make it look stylish. To make a traffic light model, we may only need a few components. But with the LED lights, we can make it seem real. The supporting elements here is Google's huge range of components. Now, the blocks can be used directly with the micro bit. Do you remember the three advantages? Okay, next, let's take a look at the differences in the appearance of Giggle control boxes. The lid of the 1.5 version is quite full. By full, I mean that it covers the whole board. This is the 1.5 version. Whereas the 2.0 version can be put in entirely. That will make some functions unavailable. This is why you have to have the right control box for your microbit version. If you are not sure, please check with your sales representative. Which version do you want to buy? Which version do you need? Just let us know. We are happy to answer questions. The 2.0 version is next. The shell on the design is concave. We can put our fingers in there. And this is for sensing. Because it is closer to our LED lights, the lights on the model will be brighter and clearer. Those are the differences between the two versions. Next, we move on to the most important part. In microbed, how to write programs. Writing programs is not complicated. But we need to know the steps and be methodical. Please go to this website on your computer and we'll get started writing a program. Teacher Sloth, are you ready? Let's go! The web link takes us to this page here. This is the microbed homepage. Click Let's code in the menu in the upper right corner. Let's start writing the program. After clicking Let's code, we can see three buttons. The first thing we see is the Make Code Editor, a graphical programming interface. This is the graphical representation of Python code. If you're already familiar with GUIS and want to use Python, then you can do that directly in any Py editor. If you are totally new to programming or if you want to see some examples, you can go to this classroom. This will give a basic overview of microbit. Let's go into make code. By clicking this button, then we see this screen. Here we can add a new project. The language you use may be different. But here is the language icon. You should be able to find your language. For example, here we can change the language to English. We get a new project frame. Of course, we can change it back to traditional Chinese if we want. It doesn't matter which language we choose. First, we have to name the project. We'll just call this test. Let's get started. The website automatically saves projects, so don't worry about losing work. If I close the tab in the middle of writing something, it will usually save automatically. But if it's turned off too frequently, it may not be recorded in time. 
let's look at the interface. On the left is the simulator. This shows all the functions and the coding results on the board. On the right is the code editor. We write our programs in this area. The code blocks are shown here. From these simple code blocks, we can perform simple actions to make the board react immediately. Let's have a go. So if you go here, but the language was wrong. Set it now by clicking the menu here. You choose your language. You can use the editor in any language you like. Next, let's introduce the basic coding blocks one by one. First are the most common blocks. Here we have the LED lights. And there are some default patterns where it can display numbered or task. It can use the lights to ship English letters. Then it displays each letter on the screen. It can show it and then clear or show it forever. That is, it repeats continuously. Also, you can make it do something when the device turns on. Another block we often use is pause. This pauses the program for a number of milliseconds. The pause here lasts for however long you tell it to. Many people may get confused with the literal meaning. That's because it's actually wait after the last action. Maybe one second or two. We can make your own adjustments. There are preset pauses too, from 100 milliseconds to 5 seconds. You can also directly key in the number you want. Let's try it. Take a use on start block, let's make it show. A hard pattern. This block we don't need. We drag over here to remove it. Now it shows the hard pattern when it turns on. You can see that the simulator shows you what happens. So there's the hard pattern. I turn it on again. It shows it again. If I change it to another pattern, like the giraffe and we restart it, it shows the giraffe. These are some basic functions. We will go much further, don't worry. Next, we'll look at the input functions. There are input blocks here where we can set thresholds. This is the biggest difference here between 1.5 and 2.0. 2.0 have the sound effect and the logo functions. Press on the logo where I showed you earlier. This is the logo and the speaker. We can guide children through lots of activities with this. Another common input function is the buttons. Here we drag the button block to the editor area. There are three combinations, A, B, and A plus B. I'll choose A plus B for this block. And it makes its own button here, below the B button. In fact, we don't need to use this extra button. We just press the left and right buttons together. Let's try it. What do we want it to do? Okay, when it starts, say hello. Then when we press the A button. Hmm, teacher's loss. Which pattern do you prefer? I like the smiley face. Okay, drag it another button block. When the button is pressed, we can see it here. If we set button A in two blocks at the same time, there's a message to prevent people from making arrows. The new button block is gray, which means it's not a valid. The program is not valid, therefore it can't run. When we change it to B, it goes purple again. Then we can give it a pattern like the basic one before. Which one do you want? Teacher's thought? This sad face. Alright, a happy face and a sad face. So if we press this B button, it will display this pattern. We can also do it like this. 
drag in another button and choose A plus B. After choosing A plus B, instruct it to clear the screen. Now we can use these three commands to test it. Then press the right mouse button. Right click, select, format code. Then they are arranged neatly. Let's try it on the simulator. Go! First, we see a hello in the marquee effect. Hello! Now, what if we press A? We get a smiley face. Now B, we get a sad face. Then A plus B clears the screen. We finish this short and simple program. Let's send it to the main board. He just lost. Did we finish everything? Yes. Great, send it to the board please. How do we do that? There are a few steps. First, you need a micro bit board. I think you all have one by now. Use the micro USB to connect it. It plugs into the Giko control box. The other end plugs into the computer. There are several ports, which may be confusing for beginners. The Giko control box has two ports that can be connected. Remember, the main board goes in the control box. Like this. After that, there is a port on the top edge. For connecting to computers and sending files. So, what's so confusing? The port on the button, which is for the power supply. Some children often wonder why the transfer is not working after they plug it in. This is power only. Data cannot pass through this port, only power. So, use the one at the top. Right now, we're connected. You should see a message pop up on the screen. Micro USB device has been connected. Driver installation should be automatic and the first time it may take a few seconds. The next job is to download the program using this purple button here. It downloads the HEX file. This is a reminder to connect the micro USB cable. Next, send it to the micro bit. All done. Now we can display the file directly in this folder. Here's the HEX file. The next bit is simple. Just drag and drop, which for us is the E drive. So if you have connected it right, drag it over here, the transfer will start. And 100% means it has completed. Now we finish writing the first program. Now it's done. We can exit the web editor. The web page will restart every time, so there's nothing more to do here. Let's check it works the way it did on the simulator. Happy face and sad face. Let's see the real thing. This is the control box and main board that we have already put the program in. Take a look. There are no weird connections. The program is already written to the memory. Just put some batteries in. And for this we need 6 AA-115V batteries. Let's put them in. If you're using this at home or in schools, we may not want to use so many batteries to be more environmentally friendly. So here, remember the power part? We can us plug it in directly. When we plug this in and turn it on, we get the hello marquee again. Plug it in here. Turn on the power. And there it is. If I press A, I get the happy face. Button B gets the sad face. Both together clears the screen. 
These are some basic actions, but we can build on a basic program and expand it with other functions. The more you want to do though, the more power you need. A lot depends on the way the power is provided. You can use batteries or main power. Either is fine. Let's do some more programming. Here's not. After watching this demonstration, do you feel like you understand microbit programming? Yes, a bit. But write the programs and then write it. And then send it to the device. Then use the control box to translate that into actual usable action. You know, even if children don't have a microbit board, they can still access the web page and learn the basic concept first. We can add more hardware as we go along. Let's go back and see more coding blocks. They are quite intuitive, and we should be able to guess at what most of them do. Music means making a noise, or at least in some sense, right? You can let it sing a song or write your own. Here are all the music blocks. Version 2.0 has some new coding blocks for sound effects. If you're on the 1.5 version, then you can't use all the 2.0 functions. So make sure you match up the versions correctly. If you are using the 2.0 version, then all the code blocks become available. The LED block controls the lights, like we saw before. That's the LED lights. Children often don't know what X and Y mean. Younger children won't have covered Cartesian coordinate systems. But we can still use it fairly easy by dragging in the plot xy block. Where's 0, 0? Use your mouse to point to a position on the main board. And the number appears here 0, 4. 0, 3, 0, 2, 0, 1. 0, 0. When we press A, the upper left corner lights up. Because its coordinate position is 0, 0. Let's try to verify it. Click play to run the program, and there's our hello marquee. Then press A. Now only this light comes up. And you can make adjustments using the LED block. In the menu, there are settings for brightness and other things. So you can change the appearance and presentation style. You can explore that by yourselves later. The radio essentially lets two microbit boards have a conversation. They can transmit to each other. There are several lessons in our manual using the radio function. For example, one can be a transmitter and the other a receiver. We can send a number. Just make sure they are set in the same group. Here's the coding block about radio group sets. For more detailed use, you should have a look at the manual. There's lots of radio functions. The loops function is also commonly used. This executes code repeatedly. The repeat and do block can be dragged in like this. Then when we press P, this time, we won't choose smiley faces because 4 will be a bit weird. Let's do fireworks instead. So I can copy the block like this. Then choose patterns to make it look like fireworks. Choose these three patterns and make it run repeatedly. We can set the number of repeats we want. Press B and there are the fireworks. It's a bit similar to setting off fireworks, as it repeats a four times. Then the screen shows the last pattern. Remember, A plus B clears the screen. Loops is another common function. This block is a judgment. When a statement becomes true or false, it will do some action. We hope you can spend some time working with this, reading the manual to learn more programming concepts. In the later examples, you'll see a lot of this in the coding blocks. I'll explain it again later. At the time, next is logic. Here are the conditional statements. If something is true, 
which means the condition is valid. And then it will do the subsequent action. Because in example here, we are using the A and B buttons functions. It's difficult to apply conditionals here. We'll come back to that later. When we do some other devices, here are two common conditionals though. Variables. So, where there are no variables selected, that means they have the default values. But when I create a new variable, and call it test, we can add three new blocks. And the variables can change according to the settings. It could be 0 or 1. This is usually used for four sensors. Touch sensors or light sensors, or something else. For variables, we will need to use some math like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. For controlling line tracing vehicles or navigating complex routes, this is its basic function. If that's not enough for you, here's an advanced topic. Click here. We have more coding blocks. And we can even choose game. This needs to match some special variables to work. These red ones are variables. When I add them in like this, it's just another application of variables. This is a part we seldom use. There are also texts that we rarely use. If you want to learn more, you can go to Microbit official website to learn those applications. Here and now, we'll focus on the pins. These will be used for infrared sensing. We can also use the extension type. If we need to extend the motors, we'll need the pins to connect them. This is really the hardware side, when we are using the 1269 Gigoset. It is also really an introduction to how Microbit works. It really focuses on electromechanical integration by integrating machinery and electronics together. Children can learn more comprehensively. If children want to go deeper with these programs, there are abundant materials here and also online. Children will be able to learn, explore, and create different results. Next, let's look at the hardware extensions. This is the pin configuration. Pin configuration is important. In this set, there are two planetary gearboxes and one servo motor. There are four sensors and line follower sensors. How can these components be applied? First, you have to get the pins in correctly. They cannot be used in a way that overlaps. What I mean by that is that if you see the numbers here, P stands for pin, pin 16 and pin 15, being used on this e-jack, means I cannot put the other pin there. Remember, when you want to connect many different external components, the pin and jack have to be available. If it is already being used, it won't work well. So, there's a number and position for each connection. And each function is different. Here we can see four numbers on the top of the jack hole. 15, 16, or something else. Like here it says 5V, which is the power supply. The GND is the ground wire, but these are not important for us. We want to look at these two numbers. The number on the upper left means that it can read signals. So what is a read signal? That's when I do something to a sensor and the sensor sends back a value. This process is reading signals. If we press down the force sensor or release it, the force sensor will send back its condition to microbit board. This one on the lower left is a right pin. What is the right signal? For example, 
If I decide to turn this light on or off, that is called a ride action. The lower left is to control the output command, i.e. turn the light on. Next, some of them like the DTM motor will require an input from two pins. If we want to use two pins, we use the digital right pin. Because pin 15 can control the steering. Like left or right, by a clockwise counterclockwise rotation, and pin 16 is used to control the speed. So that makes it faster or slower. Let's do a quick review. If you want to control the forward sensor, which pin should you use? Upper left? Yes. If you need to control the lights, use the pin on the button left. Let's go back and add some additional blocks. Let's add this 50x planetary gearbox. Why are we adding this? Because it is special. We'll need to download an additional package. First, enter this web link on the slide. We'll show you how to use it later. You should make a note of this link. You can download all the other Giga related apps you will need. Let's go through it. Before you download it, you have to make sure this is called sensors. Children often use the previous link and just copy paste it into their internet browser, which is an arrow. If you open the link in the browser, it will jump to a web page. We have to copy this link to the search bar on the extensions page. That's the search bar on the Microbit website. Don't make the mistake. Now, if you add the Giggle sensors correctly, you'll see this extra button, Sensors Below Math. If you can't see clearly when you use it, you'll get to see what it looks like. Okay, we are going to demonstrate how to download the 50x Planetary Gearbox package. Let's get started. Slot, we are going to show you all how to add a sensor in the menu. In this editor, we have added the sensors before. So I have to open another new page. That way, you can follow along. First, create a new project. The extension package tool gets wiped every time you do that. So if you made a card today, you'll have to download it again. Where can we add a package for our new motor? It's hidden in this menu here, so click Events. After opening it up and going down the list, you'll see Extensions. There's another option to find here in the Settings screen. When you click this gear setting icon, you see Extensions. You can enter the Extensions page either way. Remember to copy that link to the search bar here on this extensions page. After pasting that link, press the search icon. Giggle Coding Blocks Code Sensors will appear. Click it to add the package and then in the menu of the editor page. You'll see the sensors appear beneath math. This is the coding block you need to control the motor. We drag this block out. Look out, because when some children pull out this block, the car starts running around randomly because they didn't check the settings. So I suggest that we set those first. On start, set the speed value to 0. The motor direction can be 0 or 1. So what does that mean? Take a look at the next slide. The number 1 means turning clockwise. The number 0 means turning counterclockwise. So that's for steering. Do you remember the pin configuration? If we want to control two pins, we have to choose pin 15 to control the steering. If we choose pin 15, our corresponding jack hole is the E-jack. For the E-jack, we use pin 16 to control the speed. One controls direction, one controls speed. We set all to zero first, because we don't want the car to run away. Now follow along to make a simple model to test everything. We'll build a swing ride from an amusement park. 
It can be made with only one motor. It is also suitable for beginners. Then we just have to drag a coding block from input, so that when the button A is pressed, it will start the motor. In the motor block, set pin 15 and pin 16 as mentioned. Because they share the same pins, it's controlled by the same block. Steering can be set to 0 or 1. Power should be low at first. Try 60 to make it turn for a few seconds. Drag a coding block from basic. Set a pause timer to 5000 ms to run the motor for 5 seconds. After the motor runs for 5 seconds, it stops. Now, copy the block below. Okay, now it can stop. In this case, we can send it to the board. We'll make a simple swing ride. Are we going to start building soon? Yes, we just put this on the board first. In that way, it will work as soon as the construction part is done. It will be an interesting swing ride. Let's go! To make sure it can run the program, we need a motor that matches. The motor is the core part of the model. We just said that we are going to make a swing ride. This motor is the main structure. Let's add the frames to the motor. It can be combined with our building blocks. After this, we can connect other long frames. Just like this, when we make tall towers, it is stronger this way. Right, make it stable. After the assembly, put it on the base grid. Next, we have to make a swing part. Let's do the rotating turntable by using this gear and axle. Put it on. Make sure it spins OK. Then, on each side, we need to add the arms. We can put rods in here, but they must be symmetrical. Adjust the positions a little. And use the second hole of the rod. The other side uses the same positions. As it only has one fixing point, it's more flexible and can rotate randomly. Now we add the axles. And after another axle is installed, we press the rod to make it the same on either side. The rest is making the right seats. Here we use an axle connector. It's flexible so that the right seat can spin and fly when it works. Install a rod here and on the other side. Eventually, we'll make the right seat. I'll just use this to get a general shape. Then the same on the other side. Make a shape like this. Now our entire model is complete. This kind of work is suitable for children as beginners. They should be able to do this by themselves. Besides, this kind of swing ride and the model with spinning parts can be made with the motor and would be suitable for children. Next, let's try it out. When we were writing the program, we used two pins, pin 15 and pin 16. These correspond to the e-jack on the control box. So install it in the e-jack, connect the wires, and the power supply. Set it to run when A is pressed. So the motor spins. OK, press the button. It spins for 5 seconds and then stops. This is the swing ride model. I hope your designs were all successful. Besides the motor, there are other components and we can check their applications in the manual. Of course, in the manual, you also find some new challenges too. Take a look at the slide. What is this assignment about? Turn around to see the slide. What can you do with two line follower sensors? Or two DC motors? It can make a line tracking car. We need to add some commands. For example, activate the car by pressing A and deactivate by pressing B. So, we have to add two buttons to the program. We we'll also need a track for it to follow. So, let's make a loop using black electrical tape. It could be any shape you like, but we'll do a loop. So, let's add a time constraint. One minute with no video editing. As long as the car makes two rounds, you pass. 
this tax is more difficult. But don't worry, we have already provided some programming examples in the menu. You'll be able to download the example program and we'll be using this one. Then we can go step by step. It'll cover the line follower sensors. And we'll introduce it here to help you understand. Let's go on to the challenge. Here we open up the programming example. This one is the line tracing card in lesson 8. Here's what the program looks like. The picture looks a bit messy. But we can hide the left part, as we don't need to see the simulation. On the right, the blocks are pretty dense. You just thought, can you understand all the content? Hmm, it looks complicated. At first it does. I thought the same thing when I first looked at it. Children would also feel the same way. But although it looks complicated, it's quite simple. Why? We got a lot of functions that are nested. So if you look on the left here, this is the functions area. Now click left to see the coding blocks. Now we can see these default coding blocks. If I want to create a new one, it looks like this. The function is a bit like a box that has a lot of things inside it. It executes every comment when the program runs. So here we can see every function. And each function governs a specific thing. Let's zoom in. Now we can see the first function. It says go, which may mean go forward. There's a 0 and 1 here. And the two motor speeds are 1 to 20. Over here is the steering. One is a forward and the other backward, so the car can turn. Here we can see something called variable PWM1 is set to 150. Let's not change that variable for now. I'll explain it to you later. The next function is stop, which has to be a function that makes all the motors stop. But really, it's setting the motor speed to zero. We can look around. Left and right, there are some variables here. This one can be changed. In fact, this variable, if I want to, I can affect the speed of the motors. I hope it doesn't turn too fast or too slow when the program runs. So what we're doing here is using these to fine-tune the device. What should the variables be set to? Well, that can depend on your situation. Also, some parts might need adjusting. If you're building, say, a car, then you have to consider the size, weight, or friction from moving components. These will all affect the speed. Following the menu exactly, it's just to get started. You can make small or big mechanical changes, but the program may need to be adjusted too. So just keep that in mind. This value here, this must match the actual conditions here, which are important for the challenge. In fact, we move to the right side. The left and right sides are exactly correspondent. These two codes are similar because they both control motors. These two code blocks are mostly the same. You see, some bits are actually simple, right? Okay. This variable here influences speed. It can be found here on the menu. You can drag the coding block out, and if you click variables, there are two more commands. These can be used to make adjustments. There's another small block of commands here, but this we use as a speed value. Okay, look here. What does it mean to call stop when it is running? It stops the motor running, right? Because call stop is the stop function, right? After calling the function out, it stops. The code here is like a shortcut link to the other stop instruction. But simply, this programming example here for people familiar with programming. They can see there are really only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 functions here. It just looks complicated because of how it is packaged. It's actually pretty simple. Take a closer look. Here. This part is more challenging. This is the focus of our line tracking car. Our line tracking car uses two infrared sensors to detect the black line on the ground. Then it tells the car to move or not. Now the IR sensors return a value of 0 if something is detected and 1 if nothing is detected. So is the black line a 0 or an 1? 0? 
Zero indicates that something is detected. Then the car will follow the black line. Some people may get confused by this next bit. The IR sensor for line tracking cannot see the color black. So if the ground is white or another color, the output is zero because something is detected. But when a black line is there, the output value is one because the infrared sensors can't see the black line. It will correct its path accordingly. It will try to look for the space where it can't see a line. When the sensor output is zero on both sides, the car will appear to follow the line. Once you see how this works, put your IR sensors on the mechanism. The IR sensors are a digital grid pin. Do you remember where that is? Go to Advanced and then Pins and find a command Digital Read Pin. Here we set the two pins. Because we have two IR sensors, pin 1 and pin 8. If both sensors detect something, the car move forward. If it only detects something one side, it will turn and go back to the track. If it only detects something on one side, it turns and goes back to the track. As you know, this program isn't too hard to write. So where is the difficult part? As I just said, if the car is placed on the track or a piece of your paper, it may not move because it gets stuck somewhere. If the value is too high, it will move over the black line at the beginning. And the IR sensors don't have time to detect it. This is where you need to make adjustments in this challenge. Do you remember how to activate the car? How to make it work by pressing A plus B. We won't tell you all the answers today, but we'll leave you with a hint. In the input section, there's a command button A is pressed. So that when button A is pressed, something also happens when button B is pressed. If we drag this comment out and put it in the editor, then we can also add a conditional logic step. If button A is pressed, then it will move when something happens. We really hope you can practice and play with this part yourself at home. So, for the line tracking card we made, we will record a video. We hope you can do a couple of loops in one minute. Let's take a look at it up close. For this task, this card should go round smoothly. You can set any shape you like, but it must be a closed loop. Press the button A to start and the button B to stop. Now I synchronize it. 3, 2, 1. It took 24 seconds for our first lap. Press B to stop it when the car comes back. Okay, 51 seconds. Did you complete the line tracking car challenge? You just thought, did we do it? Yes, only 51 seconds. Wow, pretty quick. I think you could probably do it faster though. Next, let's take a look at a new product. 1206 includes an AI control box. We've talked about AI before, and there are many examples of AI we use for teaching. But, teacher Sloth, do you know what AI actually is? Is it artificial intelligence? Yes, AI is a short way of saying artificial intelligence. Why do we say it is artificial intelligence? Well, we can teach a computer some rules and it will learn. Then the computer can be used in daily life to do more things. For example, automatic license plate recognition is one kind of AI. Face recognition is another. Is the AlphaGo a kind of AI? Yes, AlphaGo is a kind of AI as well because it has received training and instruction of how to play chess or solve problems. In other words, if we can train a computer 
and it can react, it is referred to as an AI. There are, naturally, some AIs that are fake or not so smart. What's a fake AI? Fake means that everything is already in pre-programmed. So, it only runs a program using default settings. In these cases, we say that it is a fake AI or a pseudo AI. The model we are going to make with the Giggle AI control box can nearly do what true AI can do. For example, if you want to train it to recognize a picture or shape, then the AI control box can learn that. And here on the screen, where you can see the black dot, that is a camera, so it can take pictures. It also has a microphone that it can talk to. There are also speakers that it can play sound. Of all the projects we have right now, this is the most cutting edge. With this technology, now we can do many things we could not before. One thing to remember about this is that because it is more powerful, it consumes more power. And so we have to have enough 18650 batteries. There are no batteries included with this set. Let's take a look inside. What else is there except for the control box? We can see the details on the slide. Do some of these components look familiar? Microbit was using some of these parts. Let's start up here on the left. This is our planetary gearbox. It is the same motor used with the microbit set. So this motor can be used with either in the future, if you learn using microbit, then want to switch to AI, then you can still use the same motor. This is our servo motor. It can also be switched between sets. This is our IR sensor, the one used to track lines. But we can also use it for other things. This one is the force sensor, which we also used before. The special component is the 18650 lithium battery holder. This lithium battery can be used as a power bank. We can also connect it to the control box so it is the main power supply. Only the battery holder is included in the set. There's no lithium battery inside. So remember to have yours ready. Next, let's have a look at the appearance of the box. Here's the pin configuration diagram. Because some people may get confused regarding the pins. We'll go back to the micro bit and 1269. There is an important concept we mentioned. Do you remember what that was? Did you notice these pin names? These are the pin numbers. But the two point connector has different numbers here. Whether we're using the 1269 or 1206 set, all the connectors can only be used once. If you read the manual or test book, all the sockets are staggered. So you must remember this when you are teaching classes. The same pin cannot be assigned twice. Teacher's thoughts, did you remember? Please keep this in mind. Next, we have the position represented by the pins. This can be explained by the number and pin position, but there are a few places to pay attention to. For example, the B and F pins. These two, sometimes the default setting is on. So, if I use the B and F pins to install a servo motor or planetary gearbox, once it's installed, it will run as soon as it is turned on. This is because some pins are on as a default. If you want to install a motor to make the robot or model move, I suggest you use A, E, C, and G, these four pins, because it is off by default. So when it starts, it won't run by itself. If you want to use other pins, you can set the pen condition first in the program. Set it to off. From our manual or lesson plan, you can find some examples. Next, let's see how to install the battery. 
This battery holder is not like general power bank, a regular gigo battery holder. The main difference is that the holder is a special shape and has a unique patent for lead and needs a small tool to open it. But a coin would do just fine. Once it's open, we can put the battery in. But when we close it, the holder stays closed by itself. This makes it safe for children to use. If you don't have coins in your hand, you can find any flat object to open the battery holder. Remember to turn it on. The most important thing is this lithium battery which must be inserted the correct way around. Once you buy and insert the battery, you don't have to take it apart because you can charge it using a USB cable. You don't have to remove it and use an extra device to charge it. As long as you have the correct cable and the control box, you can use a computer or any device to do the charging. Next, let's take a look at the Web AI Programming Interface. This page is the page after you log in. It is actually similar to the microbit editor, only slightly different. I'll show you some simple ways to operate it. First, enter the screen. The one at the beginning has a URL link on the side. You can navigate to this page, and when you click it for the first time, you log in with your Gmail account, or you can register a new account. You can log into this page as long as you are logged in. Now we can see these programming blocks here. If you want to change the language of these blocks, select More from here, and click Language and look for the English version. If you don't understand Chinese, remember you can change the language here. So once you've chosen your language, and there's no problem there, you'll see most of the functions are familiar. For example, here's basic variables over here, and logic, which are the most common ones like if clause or if some numerical calculations are required. The loops function is here. Math. Here is for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Here we have text. And this is interesting because the device has a better screen. So if we enter some text, it can be displayed directly on the screen. This is rarely used because it's for drawing or the mathematical plots and diagrams. Then there's functions, which we are familiar with. First, you grab a block, then put all the programming blocks in it. Then it all condenses into one new block. These basic functions are very similar to the ones we learned before. The fun place is in the advanced blocks. Click list to open the panel. File read and write is kept here. We can let the device read some pictures, and also put things up on the screen. If you want to use this function, it can take pictures, but also analyze pictures on an SD card. If you want to know more about this, there are some good examples in the manual. The QR code scanner also has some example applications in the manual, like where it scans the QR code, then after that, execute commands that are in the QR code. Next is the color tracking function. So pick the color you want to track, or a face or picture to detect. All these things can be set by us. Of course, some face information may not be available to the device if people are wearing masks. So some time may need to be spent fixing the variables. Or if we don't provide enough training images, it won't identify things properly. If the library volume is sufficient however, it can work very well. Image classification is mostly used to distinguish some images so that it can function as the real AI does. Next here is the object tracker. After we train the AI with a model, it can chase this model and run everywhere after it. Or it can swivel and adjust the orientation so the camera always faces it. These are fairly common AI functions. One example of object tracking is someone is running a red light or doing something illegal. We can use this object tracker. 
the tag is to detect the keyboard or other external commands. Underneath, Advanced, we can see the Web AI panel, which functions have been added first in the board, which for us is the most important part. In Web AI on each device, there is a serial number on each control box. You must connect the control box with the corresponding number. Only then will it be fully usable. So, when you read a sample file, the most important thing is to change this number. Change it to the number you find on your control box. Then the programs will all run correctly. Another change is the LCD screen. You can enter some text here and take the content of our text block. Put it here and then it will draw a picture. In this case, a circle, but it can draw different shapes. Of course, it can also show images on the screen. You can make it display anything you like. Next is the button input. This is for managing the accessories. It also lets you set comments for the two small L and R switches on the control box. It can be set to act when pressed or when released. It performs an action when the comments is valid. Next is the microphone which will need a memory card to record sounds. If we want to use the microphone to record, be sure to prepare a memory card ahead of time. The I.O. pins here are for adding various devices to unused pins. Just enter the correct pin number so the command can execute correctly. Finally, let's look at this menu. For the extensions that haven't been mentioned yet, MQTT is for broadcasting, just like the microbit. We can connect external devices if we set the channels correctly. Then two web AIs can communicate with each other because we went through all this with the microbit. It's easier here as it is the same. Continuous servo motor is to control a servo motor. It controls rotation and speed, so it can perform as a car, a robot. For example, the speaker can play back sounds from the file we just recorded. Or you can just put some files in the SD card. These can be web files or sound effect files. Last but not least, did you spot a giggle block down below? This giggle block contains all the parts we added, such as for the motor controls. DDM motor refers to giggle planetary gearbox. This is different from the continuous servo motor. If you buy a continuous servo motor, it is usually a square. This is similar to a product from the Giggle set. It's a 1247 set. I don't know if you still remember it. 1247 has a continuous servo motor. Its speed is slower, but the DTM motor used here is for a planetary gearbox, so its maximum speed is higher. The IR sensor works the same way as the one we looked at earlier. The line sensor we saw on the previous slide. The bottom block is for the orange connector of the force sensor. The orange connector is a switch that can be pressed as an external switch. Finally, we come to the LED lights in this set, and we have four in total. You can add as many code control blocks as you like. This example here only shows the basic functions. The blocks we will use most often are the giggle block and basic block. Sometimes we use advanced functions. For example, we also use image classification. After introducing these blocks, I think you already have a fair grasp of programming for some of the later challenges. You can load a sample file directly. Before we get to that, let me show you how to train an AI. First, we need a picture set so it knows what to look for. It has to learn to discriminate. Let's go on to the next part. We have to connect the main control box first. For this, we will need to connect to the Wi-Fi. We need a Wi-Fi connection to send the files back and forth. Modify or edit commands. We can go to more here to enter the Wi-Fi settings. Once we're in, set up your Wi-Fi network password details. You'll need all the Wi-Fi device names and passwords. I'm using a company Wi-Fi here. And this is how I log in. I need a name and password. 
Then I go to settings. This gives me a QR code. This code is for the main control box to scan. Then I connect the control box to the power supply. When you are connecting for the first time, use this right hand button. And you get into QR scanning mode. After entering scanning mode, just let it find the code. Once the device spots the code, it'll enter the Wi-Fi settings. You can see that it has grabbed an SSID here. Make sure it is the same as your network information. Okay, let's continue. After setting up the Wi-Fi connectivity, we need to find the education platform. There's a link on the slide for this. You can use it to get there directly. The main page looks like this. There's a version AI platform, and if you want to start using it right away, you can log in with a Gmail account or stop and register a separate account. Then it appears on the version AI platform. Language settings are in the upper right hand corner. Let's change it back. This is a section for model training and image classification. While training, we can find two parts to do a demonstration. After you've seen these two parts, then I'd like you to do a short assignment. So, this demonstration will be different from the assignment, but it'll help and you can use some parts of it. Click the Add button to add models. I'm using two cubes of different colors. I create a category, type red here. After creating a new category, I can upload images directly, or a better way might be to use WebAI directly. On WebAI, it will ask you for a device ID. If you don't know the ID, you'll have to unplug the power cable and restart the control box. When it has restarted, it'll show the device ID when it turns on. This one 60C3DE. Okay, put that here. 60C3DE. Once that's done, you get the option to rotate the camera. Either way is fine. You should probably turn it on to take better pictures. If you finish the settings, you can click the Create Category button. Then it'll send the instruction to the control box. It sends the commands out. And now we can use it to take photos. Here I can rotate the camera. The lens appears here. And this is where we train the model. The model I just trained is this one here, red. Now take photos here because identification requires different angles of the model. Remember that we have to take at least 20 photos of each thing. This is the number of photos you've taken so far. Press here and it will start taking pictures. Now, to the front side, in the center, and a little to the left. Now a bit to the right, the top, and the button. A few from upper left some on upper right, now the lower left, and lower right. The best strategy is to just keep taking pictures randomly. More photos means a greater chance of successful identification later. The data set you are building provides the information it needs. After 20 photos, they will upload automatically. Now, go back to the main screen. You can see that we have built the first model. After creating the red model, the screen will show that the upload is complete. Next, let's create another category. We have to do the same thing again. Add. This one, we'll call yellow. Okay, use the web AI. Make sure the ID number is the same. Rotate the camera. If everything is okay, click create category. Then. It will transmit the commands. Transfer the commands here. 
We can see from the main control box that there is a lens here too. Let's place the cube where we can get a picture of the front side, then the left, and right. Now the top side, underside, top right, top left, bottom left, bottom right. Zoom out. Now left a bit, then right a bit. Tilt it a bit. Be a little bit casual with it. Catch different angles. If you're getting tired, just press a few clicks, then it will upload automatically. Now let's go back to the main screen. We can see that there are already two categories here. Let's add another. Why add another category? Because if I want to make it distinguish red from yellow, if there are only two categories, we can only know these two things. There will be some misjudgment. If I add a category and call it empty set, in programming, we use the word null. Then I can find something with no information to take a picture of. Maybe give it a wide background. Like a piece of paper. Then the MP set I create has nothing in the picture. It looks like this. Because it's an empty collection, I don't have to take pictures carefully. After 20 pictures, go back to the screen. And you'll see the empty set here. In this case, it's all ready to go. The things we want to classify are trained. Next, click model here. To add a model, set the model name as test. After that, over here, we use select category. We choose from the categories. Now, here, the order matters. Check these three. Then create a model. After creating the model, it is training. When the training is complete, let's take a look at what we've done. Remember the category names are like this, and the sorting order matters. The sorting order affects classification. Click. We click to download a model, and it can be recorded in the main control box. If you train something different every time, you must download the correct model to use. Here you can download the model and enter the device ID. 6DC3DE After that, click here to download the model. You'll send the commands. Then, if you look at the main control box, you'll do a quick restart. Then, download the model. When downloading, you must wait until it gets to 100%. Otherwise, it won't function correctly. It usually takes one or two minutes to download. If you have more pictures or categories, it would take longer. Once it's downloaded completely, we can enter any data we like when we write the program. That will help with the classification. The time taken is shown below. So far it has taken about 70 seconds, but it should be done within about 2 minutes. Actually, this training speed is quite fast. After it's trained, go to the next step. Read our sample file. Modify a few parameters. And you can see the variations. Hit OK to confirm. And we can write a program for classification. Have you already learned the basic model training method? Yes. You just asked, do you feel ready to take a small challenge? It's not a really tough one, because we spend a lot of time learning with this model today. Can you take this existing model and adjust the data? The challenge is this. Here's the sorting machine from the second lesson. You remember lesson 2? It can divide things to left and right. The assembly guide can be found in the manual. Let's take a look here. 
This is the pan configuration. First install two lights. And the server motor uses pin 7. Pin 7? Okay. We assign the B and F holes as the light connection. And this is because we already have this set up as the default. If you want to adjust any data, it's fine. You can directly adjust your parameters inside the sample file. Next, right. We were talking about a challenge. We need to use the sorter and the image recognition function. It'll have to distinguish between images and you can record it working for one minute. No speed adjustments allowed. The goal is to sort all the parts successfully five times. So if the parameters are set properly, it should be fairly easy to do. Let's read the sample file. If there is no sample file, we can email it to you. Once you get the file, open it directly here. Open it up. Click Import. Select Sorting Machine. It'll warn you that you're going to override the existing settings. Click OK. Now what should we do first? Do you remember the Wi-Fi connection? Well, when I had my pencil and paper earlier, there was a set of numbers for the Wi-Fi settings and I was making a note of those. So, the first important thing is to check and adjust the Wi-Fi settings if you need to. Make sure everything is correct. During the training time, the number is 60C3DE. So here we key in 60C3DE again. And now it's set. We can see that the pins for LED lights here are B and F. This is the same as in the manual. The default setting is off. Let's continue. Set the servo to 90 degrees first. Remember it has two directions, left and right. So we'll set it to P7. This is the position of the pin we just installed. The difficult part of this is to set the model. In the manual, there is a model that has already been trained. But we just retrain our own model. Here's thoughts. If we just train our own model, we now have to select a new one from the menu here. What if there is no other options? Well, you may have to check if it is trained on your machine. Or if you haven't used it, you can just type in a name. Because I already entered it, I can go straight to test. This was the name we gave it before. Back on the Vision AI platform. One more thing to notice is that if you remember, the empty set was null. Another was red. And the other was yellow. But the order is different from the names on the training platform. If this happens, please use the value here. And pass it into the space here. We have to make sure that the order of items in the control box and the program are the same. Now, if you find that there were no mistakes, and that the categories are all correct, you must then make sure the names of the categories and image training. Platform are also the same. Here, they are the same for the camera settings, like reverse or width and height. We just use the defaults. No need to play with those. Next, start identifying the images. Here it shows an identification name and the identification confidence. During identification, the confidence value affects everything. The one is the default example from the manual. So we have to change it to red. This is case sensitive. If you use lowercase, all the letters here should be lowercase. For a higher success rate, here we key in red. The most important thing is the confidence level. 
if the confidence value is set too low, identification may be incorrect. It cannot recognize that from right or it will put it in the wrong category. How do we check this confidence level? We'll do that through the main control box later. We change the number 5 here to yellow. But that won't change the confidence level because we are not sure about the conditions. Later, if the screen has neither red nor yellow, what will happen? It shows null. After confirming all the program data, because we've confirmed Wi-Fi data and that main control box has connected successfully, we just hit execute. Then it will start the program. You send it directly to the main control box. Next, let's take a look at the screen on the main control box. After it loads the program, it recognize that there are no objects in front of it. So it'll show the new screen. Now let's adjust some parameters. During the process of fine-tuning the parameters, the background can end up affecting the values. The data settings you see now are suited to my current environment. If you do the assignment later, please adjust it for your own environment. See here, when I place a red cube, the confidence value is as high as 0.9 or higher. So now we know that it can distinguish red cubes correctly. Let's remember this number. Next, we'll try a yellow cube. This yellow cube was recognized as a red cube. That may be because of its shape or its position. If it's identified as a red cube, we have to fix a few things. Did you find that although it's get recognized as a red cube, the confidence value was lower than 0.9? It may never reach this number. So, it's important to set the parameters correctly. When will it be regarded as yellow? Let's move the lens. Sometimes it will appear yellow from this angle. It shows yellow. The confidence value for yellow is between 0.6 and 0.7. In order to improve detection rates, we can try setting it to 0.6. For the red value, what number should we choose? Because the value is very high, we can set it higher than 0.9. Yellow here has some arrows but the value doesn't reach 0.9. The red threshold above 0.9 would not activate it. But if you want to activate the yellow part, well, you may need at least 0.5 or 0.6 or more. We can use these parameters to adjust the content. Next, we change the data in the program. Go back to the program editor, and you'll be able to make changes to confidence cut off. So, where it says red, we can put a value so that when we place a red cube down, the confidence value is high, usually more than 0.9. But for the yellow cube, when that is getting identified, the confidence value has one part that is recognized as red. That means, if we don't set the value properly, it may recognize the yellow cube as a red cube. When it is a red cube, it must exceed 0.9. So we can set 0.9 as a safe number here. That way, it won't make incorrect decisions. For the yellow part, I just found that when it's identifying the yellow cube, it is often seen as red. But when it recognizes as yellow, the confidence level is relatively low. So we have to set its confidence value to around 0.6. Let's do that now. So, when it sees the red cube and the confidence value exceeds 0.9, it will be classified correctly. If it identifies a yellow cube because it doesn't meet the 0.9 confidence level, that's okay, it just has to get 0.6 or more for the yellow. Going forward, we can use the 0.6 as the standard, so it can make correct assessments. Now, 
We must remember the parameters are fed by the environment and the background. You need to adjust these values according to your current situation. We also need to teach children how to account for this. Once the values are adjusted, for example, here we have lights on and off, and then divide things to left or right. These are defaults. So you only need to adjust the parameters here this time. Once you've done that, you can hit execute. And the program will be sent to the main control box. Then, just a sample. The control box as part of the model. And you can sit back and watch the result. So, the moment has come. Did we get it right? Let's take a look. The complete model looks like this. These cubes to be classified are determined according to the model you just created. What do you want to classify? Here we use a simple example. I use red here and yellow there. After identification, the respective light will turn on. And for this challenge, we only need to sort the blocks 5 times successfully. Let's take a look at the first round. Success. Second time. Success. Third time. We need to adjust the position a bit. Success. Fourth time. Because its lens is here, it needs to be aimed. One more time and... Success! We managed to sort them successfully five times. I think you all managed to do it as well. Your thoughts were successful? Yes, I got it. Really? I adjust several times. Well, everyone needs to adjust it. This particular control box and AI application doesn't really emphasize the mechanical part so much. It's more about how to understand, manage, and apply data. What part do we need to pay attention to when we write programs? The program focuses on the logical part, that is how you arrange your program the sequence and thresholds to determine what it'll do. The model is designed to be used just like a real sorting machine. If you try to use different shapes or different objects, can you still make it function? This course has focused on the exploration of programming and AI. We sincerely hope that children can discover more possibilities from the components they have and the programming possibilities. We hope they find it fun, exciting, and interesting. Children will be able to begin with these examples, use them in various ways, but then begin to wonder, hmm, I wonder if I could use it like this. What about facial recognition doorbells or facial recognition for anything? As long as we encourage children to explore every function and push the device to its limit, they'll really get the most from the learning experience. This brings our programming course to an end. Next, we'll be bringing you into the wonderful world of GreenMath.